Nothing changes instantaneously. In a gradually heating bathtub, you'd be boiled to death before you knew it. Our Father, who art in heaven. Seriously? What the actual fuck? Gilead doesn't care about children. Gilead cares about power. Why does healing have to be the only goal? Why can't we be as furious as we feel? For whatever man sows, so shall he reap. Welcome to Above the Garage. Hi, friends. Today's interview is with David McCallum, who is sound supervisor on The Handmaid's Tale and has been since season one. We really started paying a lot more attention to sound on this latest rewatch, and uh, you should too. It's incredible. It is fascinating. He is fascinating. He has great stories. He also does ADR, which is the dialogue replacement, which you cannot notice because it sounds so seamless. But we hope you guys enjoy this chat as much as we did with David McCallum. How are you? Good, thanks. How are you guys? Good, good. Is it still snowy there? Yeah, it's pretty... uh... It's pretty cold and snowy right now. Yeah, it's like freezing here. I'm in Philly. It's oh, okay. so cold, but it hasn't snowed all winter. So my kids are, are displeased uh, with the universe. We were, uh, for Christmas, we went to, Christmas holiday, we went to Sault Ste. Marie, which is sort of, I guess, the, like right on the border of northern Michigan. Uh-huh. We had more more snow than we can could imagine but then when we came home there was none so we've had a bit of extremes but then it just snowed last week that's perfect it was for christmas yeah. right yeah. yeah yeah like a white christmas that would be enough for me all winter a good snowy yeah. white christmas and then check out uh, it, it was um like feet of snow oh. <laughs> also, like, <laughs> i think we i think we got two two meet about two meters of snow in about four days so oh my god also <laughs> that was very kind of you to translate yeah. to american for for us yeah okay. <laughs> kimberly's a meter user i yeah. believe was what a meter kimberly uses meters right yeah why? What do you use? Yeah, everybody in America, right? And we call it soccer. I mean, Canada uses a hybrid. It depends on what you're measuring. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, in terms of there's a chart that is quite funny about Canadian measurement. If you're measuring height, people usually talk about feet. It, uh-huh. and it's like it's a real mixed bag, and it makes <laughs> there's no logical sense to it, but it's kind of true. Everyone sticks to it. Hmm. Um, David, I wanted to ask you, like, so you're in Toronto. Yes. You've been there for a long time? Yeah, my whole life. Most of my life. I was, I went to university in another town in Ontario, but I've lived in Toronto my whole life. Okay. Because I was, we were watching a movie, My Winnipeg. Oh, yeah. um, The Guy Madden film. And I wondered if you were from Winnipeg, (laughs) because I know he's from Winnipeg. Uh, I did about, there was a window of time when I worked with Guy, and I did about three or four of his films. uh, And it's because his producer was a friend of mine. And um, he, his producer was from Toronto. And so um, he, like I did um, my Winnipeg, I did um, Saddest Music in the World. I did a short film with him called The Heart of the World. Just the best short film I've ever seen. Oh wow! Um, it's insane. You can watch it on YouTube. It is absolutely insane. It's about five or six minutes long. It's incredible. The heart of the world. Definitely watch it. I have to go watch it. Cool. But you know, guys, a bit. Uh, he he's an, a bit of an oddball, and I haven't worked with him. And since that producer stopped producing, I haven't worked with him. But I don't actually think he's worked in Toronto since then either. Okay, gotcha. Very very lovely guy. Yeah. yeah, that film was really interesting. The kind of, we, we were just fact checking everything. Like, is this real? This can't be real. Yeah. Like, <laughs> well, <made> a, lot, <laughs> a lot of it's made up, but some of yeah. it's real. A lot of it's made up. Yeah, he, he doesn't care about that. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't care about that. Like, almost like mockumentary, but like not quite. Yeah. Yeah, I enjoyed it. So David, can you just explain to everyone listening what your role is as a sound supervisor? Sure. There's um, the sound team. Uh, there's multiple departments and multiple people that work in uh, sound post-production for The Handmaid's Tale. And myself and my uh, colleague partner, Jane Tattersall, are the two sound supervisors. I've been working with Jane for my entire career. I started with her in the mid-90s and sh- I started apprenticing with her. And we run the sound post-production 
for the show, we have a team uh, in, in the, the work gets divided up. So Jane is responsible for the sound effects. She has a sound designer named Brennan Mercer, a sound effects editor named David Caparelli. And on the dialogue side, uh, which is my area of expertise, mm -hmm. I have a dialogue and ADR editor named Kristen Hunter and um, a dialogue editor on season five named Dustin Harris. There's also the Foley department, which is done at Footsteps. It's a, st a recording studio that only does Foley. Foley is the kind of physical sounds that you might hear from the characters, the actors, um, their footsteps, anytime they touch something or pick something up and put it down. Um, mm. it, it's not quite that simple, but it gives you a <laughs> sense of like, yeah. when, when you see people moving, we recreate their sound in Foley so that we have control over it. Mm -hmm. Within the, there, there, there's then also the mixing department. Our two mixers are Lou Solikovsky and Joe Morrow, and they've been on the show since day one as well. I've mixed every episode of the series. Awesome. Did Joe do Women Talking with you too? He did, yeah. yeah. Uh, Lou and Joe both mixed Women Talking. That's awesome. And we work together in segregated departments yeah. where we all sort of take on our area of specialty and we have a lot of dialogue and interaction, um, but we've all worked together for a long time. So we've got a pretty thorough understanding of what each other is going to do. Mm -hmm. My specific role as the uh, is the dialogue supervisor. So I oversee all of the production sound editorial. Um, so after the picture editors are done with the work, we get um, all of their selected takes, the sound from all of their selected takes. And mm -hmm. the dialogue editor and the dialogue department is responsible for organizing and sorting through that, cleaning it up, trying to um, make different angles uh, smooth and, and um, seamless in their transitions, repairing uh, things where uh, there is unwanted sound from set, as well as recording the or uh, spotting and overseeing the ADR recording. Um, so I do all of the principal actor ADR and Kristen mm -hmm. looks after all of the loop group and crowd ADR, which would be like, for example, there's a lot of crowd recordings that we do for the handmaid's tale, principally, uh, all of the handmaids, all of the wives, anytime there's a group of them mm -hmm. uh -huh. and that we would, we would re-record that. And it's been a big part of our show right from day one. If you can imagine in the early yeah. episodes, early seasons, when you would have 20 and 30 uh, we have a lot of groups. Mates, we have a lot of groups. Yeah. Um, so I work with the actors to record their replacement dialogue and Dustin, Kristen and I all build that and put it together before handing it to Lou and Joe when they take over the, the final mixing part of it. So when do you, when do the principal actors need to replace dialogue? It's something like you guys watch and it just, it, you can't remove sound from it or, or what is the scenario in which they need to come record? Uh, there's a few. Um, the first most obvious one is if there's a new line that has been written uh, or that they need for the story. Mm. Uh, second would be if some, if we didn't quite understand something, it wasn't enunciated properly. It was too quiet. Uh, for some reason, it just doesn't translate to screen as, uh, as clearly as we would want. Uh, we would then maybe need to record ADR for something that um, there's too much noise or too much unwanted sound that doesn't suit the the location uh, of some kind, uh, a technical uh, flaw. And then it's it's not common on Handmaid's Tale, but we might do performance changes as well, where somebody's looking to you know just create a slightly different nuance in the way they deliver a line. And so those are the primary reasons why we would do something. Uh, I get a list from the picture editors of what it is that they've identified, which are primarily the things that they need new lines um, is, what, is what they would send to us. My job is to evaluate the production sound to determine what else we might need. Uh -huh. And recording ADR with the actors is difficult on The Handmaid's Tale, more difficult than it is on other shows. And that's primarily because of the 
nuance of their performances. It's mm -hmm. it's just tricky. They're not repeating themselves. The show isn't shot in a kind of very standard, predictable, wide shots, close up shots. So there's a lot of irregularity to what they're doing while they're acting. And that can be difficult to re-record. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we do, I, I try to stick to a kind of pattern of what I think is a reasonable amount of time to bring the actors in. Once I know we have to bring them in mm -hmm. for something, then I'll, I'll, I'll try to create a list that I think suits what I think they can do. Um, obviously, we do ask for everything we think that we need. So some episodes have a lot more than others, um, but there's a limit to how long we can have for them. Right. They just don't have that much time, particularly if they're still in production. Mm -hmm. So we try to be very structured in what our expectations are of them. So, you know, mm -hmm. we, we set a threshold of where we think is reasonably tech, reasonable technically for us. Are there cases where you just can't get something done that you want? Like, it's not perfect to you and we would never notice it, but you like just weren't practically able to re-record it. Yeah, like there's probably some really easy examples of to explain. Like if you remember in episode in season four, episode 406, when June and Moira were on the tugboat, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. and, and they got a very emotional uh, argument. Yeah. They're le legitimately driving on a tugboat in the middle of Lake Ontario. <laughs> like there's, there's no control over the sound no. in, in yeah. that mm -hmm. scene. And the picture editor is a good friend of mine. He sent me a messages in advance, very, very worried about yeah. the scene because it's a long mm -hmm. scene. I think it's four or five minutes long. Right. Mm -hmm. Important. Yeah. And there's just no way we could record it. It sounded terrible, like dreadfully bad. <laughs> <laughs> but there's no way you could ask Lizzie you and Tamara to come in and, hey, re-record this. So, I, you know, I, I spent days on the scene trying mm -hmm. to elevate it and basically creating a threshold of like, okay, this is good enough for the yeah. scene. And we re-recorded a few lines, not many. Most of that scene is production sound. We recorded a little bit of it. You know, it doesn't like now it doesn't sound great to me at all by by any stretch. <laughs> it's not good sounding, but it's fine sounding. And I don't yeah. think anyone watching the show cares. Um, no, we watch very closely and we could never have told yeah. you that that scene sounded any different. Yeah, but it, but it's an example of in my job where I want something to sound as clear as my voice oh. sounds right now almost all the time. It's just not possible on on this show. So, you know, the actors are the actors are really supportive. Lizzie can do and will do anything, but she trusts that you know, I'm not going to ask her to do a 5 minute emotional right. scene. Uh, <laughs> all scene all over again, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I, I I get very little pushback from them at all, but I think that's, that's over the course of the five seasons, we've developed an understanding of, you know, they trust that what I'm asking of them to do, we do need. It's important, uh, yeah. Yeah. They might ask questions about it, but they're they're pretty trusting of of our process at this point in time mm -hmm. so are you are you responsible for all of her voiceovers then yeah no that's me and and lizzie we've um in the first season especially the first few uh episodes uh reed was was there and bruce was there uh -huh. but by the by the end of the first season i think it was just lizzie and it's just been lizzie and me um, oh, cool. to together for the VOs. I miss those. Those are great. Yeah, you know, we we it's funny because we did only one line in season five, and uh -huh. yeah. we we sat down and Lizzie recorded the line, and as soon as she was done, she sort of her eyes sort of went up, and she's like, "I missed this." Uh -huh. <laughs> and uh -huh. it was like, it, and it is fun. Um, they're so funny too. That I think they're really good for the show because we're rewatching like season one just for fun in the group right now, and and. They're just her thoughts are very funny and add a lot of yeah. levity to the scene. But I get it. There was one voiceover they were going to do, in fact, because we saw the screeners. Um, so it wasn't finished, you know. And then we're going to add a voiceover, I think, with um, Hannah. It was related to yep. Hannah. She was in the garden thing. Yeah. Anyway, yep. but it never came to fruition. So. Yeah, there were actually about, I'm going to say, six to ten lines in season five that were on scripts mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. didn't get didn't get recorded and yeah that's usually when they get dropped it's usually 
the picture editor Bruce and Lizzie deciding that it's not necessary. Um, right. mm. And I don't know, you know, I don't talk to Bruce that much about this. He's not in Toronto anymore. Right. Um, in the first couple of seasons, we had more kind of dialogue because I always wanted to kind of understand motive. Yeah. But uh, I haven't spoken to him about why less voiceover. But I think now that June is no longer in Gilead, I don't know that she has the same introspection of her own life as she had when there. I don't think Mm -hmm. she's as aware of or in control of her own emotional dynamic. And so I just Mm -hmm. think when they get to the scenes, it feels added on top of the stories right it doesn't feel natural yeah that's... it's interesting because i think that the the effect for me personally is she seems almost less happy in canada than she did in gilead just because we could hear her being her you know sarcastic self or whatever when she was in gilead so not hearing that is actually making me like sadder <laughs> yeah. it's great and it makes sense she's in canada without her daughter like she's not happy she's you know i think trauma plays a much bigger role in june's arc uh once yeah. she's left you know, trying to reconcile her experience. Yeah. Yeah. And they say in the moment you can't, you know, you can't process it. You have to survive it. But then when you get out. Mm -hmm. Something I was going to ask you was actually about um, when you first started the show, did Bruce tell you anything in particular that he wanted to convey with the show or like any type of vision that he gave you? You know, Bruce made it clear that he really likes authentic in in specifically with respect to sound but i think it's it's a, a an aesthetic that is across the board for him he mm-hmm. he doesn't like or want things to be perfect he wants them to be natural and real mm-hmm. uh, he doesn't really like or care if we record adr mm-hmm. very much he, he would be perfectly happy with bad noisy sound um <laughs> but he but he trusts us you know yeah he seems to be very good at picking the best people and then trusting them to do their job yeah uh, like and i think in the in the first couple of seasons there were more questions back and forth and you know i remember one time debating this was in season one there was a voiceover issue because the voiceover recorded didn't fit Mm -hmm. the time that we had and i couldn't get all the words in it was a long voiceover section i think it was i don't know it was in the middle of the season probably up episode like between four to seven Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i didn't quite know what to do about it and so i built three versions and put the first one forward but uh when we were done nobody had any comments about it and the voiceover had definitely changed from what had been written and i asked bruce at the time you know i wasn't sure what to do about this and what's his feedback and he said that he thought it was you know he was happy with what was there and his words though were always just trust your own instincts do what you think is best if i don't like it then i'll ask for something different but always Mm -hmm. put forward what you think is the best option first that's great and so that was a nice confidence builder at a time when i didn't really know him very well at all as we'd never worked together before but it's just Mm -hmm. like trust your instincts and and follow those we're at a point now where like i don't think he gave us a dialogue or ADR note in season five, like change the ADR take. I don't think we got one in the entire season. Right. Nice. He was content with it. And, and actually, I think at one point, somebody else had given a note and he sort of, in a very polite and f- comical way, chastised them for questioning <laughs> our choices. <laughs> Just like, you know, trust your experts. Um, yeah. this is, this is, uh, but, you know, he we, we hide it. Like we really do try to make the, we, we spend a lot of time making the adr sound bad so that it fits in with the with the production sound <laughs> well it so works. That nobody nobody can notice it the the objective is we don't know we, we couldn't name one replaced by no. this season uh-uh. so good work but i wouldn't call it bad <laughs> speaking of changing like you said changing the voiceover to match is there ever something where you've ch- you've had to change a line of dialogue in post just maybe the person's face wasn't in the shot or something and you just changed the line. If you feel like something in the scene was unclear maybe and you had to add words to Oh yeah, that that we do do that for sure. Like either to make a point a bit clearer or if somebody mm-hmm. swallows like the beginning of a line or something like that. These are the kinds of nuanced details that are kind of my job of like 
oh, I need a clear, you know, he off the top because they kind of went to got. And it's like it should have been he got. Mm -hmm. It's like we just, you know, like little details where, but, you know, I'll do that as well with going through all of the takes. So, you know, when I get the material from the picture editors, I also get everything that was shot. So if there are eight takes of a particular shot, I'll listen to them all and make sure that I've got a collection of tools that I can use to either repair or create more clarity in what the actors have said without changing their performance too drastically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but I will adjust it and change it if I feel like you know, particularly if you're doing just a basic shot reverse shot and the microphone shifts on the reverse shot, all of a sudden you don't have a boom microphone for the lead actor, but they're continuing to talk. And mm. but you can see the side of their face so that all of a sudden it's like boom and radio sound and then radio only sound and then boom sound. If I can't make the radio microphones sound exactly the same, I'll replace it's pretty standard to replace the off camera lines with one from mm. the sync slate so that it sounds completely smooth. Yeah. Right. And, you know, usually the actors' performances are consistent enough. When we're really lucky, we'll get multiple booms to record it, but sometimes we don't get any booms in the show just by the nature of the way it's shot. It can be very mm -hmm. unpredictable how the setups go. And so there's no real pattern of, I never know what kind of microphones I'm gonna have access to in a scene. Mm -hmm. Do you talk to the onset sound yeah. during production a lot? Production sound recording is a really, really difficult job on The Handmaid's Tale, like really difficult. It, you know, it's often really cold out. Um, yeah. The emphasis in production is very much on how the show looks mm -hmm. they'll run like we'll be they'll be doing a scene inside and they'll be running a rain machine or a snow machine outside mm -hmm. because there's like a little bit of snow in the outside the window and it's in the sound is got a <laughs> <laughs> running yeah. all, all through it or something like that um and they don't know when they'll be able to get a boom microphone in so they're they're yeah. constantly having to work with the costume department to find positions for the radio microphones. I, I talk with them fairly thoroughly, but it's a it's a very demanding gig. And, you know, I try to be as respectful of how difficult yeah. their job is. Uh, but they'll they'll let us know if like there's a problem that they've encountered or something like that. Yeah, they so you know it's coming. Yeah, I'd love to know <laughs> what's the most amount of cakes that you've ever had to like go through. <laughs> Like someone sent you like a billion jillion or <laughs> in in the handmaid's tale it's never that many because they have to move quickly yeah okay. um yeah. usually we would get like the most we might get would be say maybe 10 to 12 takes from set mm -hmm. but usually it's four or five but on uh women talking since somebody asked a question about women talking the speech that claire forey if you've seen the movie the sort of big speech that she gives in mm -hmm. the, early in the movie they did 127 takes of that holy shit. it wasn't 100 it wasn't necessarily 127 on oh my god claire on her right. character but she she had to deliver it 127 times oh my god because of the the number of takes that they did with wow. all of the actors and i swear to god that's wild like she's on for all of them every single one. Oh my god wow wow that's so unbelievable yeah what a fun fact wow that's the most wow. i've ever uh had did that take you a long time i don't even know yeah. how you choose between those because you'd yeah. be like watching the 10th one and be like wait no i like I this know. one better and yeah, then you're on like uh... the 30th one Oh, right there's, now. there's no fast way through it when you're doing <laughs> something like like for Claire um there was a little bit this isn't something that I deal with on Handmaid's Tale at all but there was a little bit of accent repair work to be done for Claire Foy and Jesse Buckley on on women talking mm -hmm. subtle very very subtle but yeah. little things like making sure in the middle of these emotional speeches we don't hear or aren't questioning the consistency of their accent. Mm, okay. wow. yeah. And so it was, there was a lot of like listening to every take. Jeez. I would I literally crazy. spend it. Yeah. And, and there is a kind of, is this one better? I don't know. It's yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> listen to this one again. Uh, and I've got a whole kind of color coding scheme. When I hear something that I kind of like, I'll identify it and give it a color That's smart. Uh, because it's, it's all spread out in my computer and it wow. can be like, yeah. 
And then you sometimes you just take something and experiment with it. Does this work? No, that didn't work. And then I'll color code it differently. And right. it yeah. can be uh, when you're doing that kind of weedy work, it can be very slow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Jeez. Do you take sometimes one or two words from a different take? Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Yeah, wow. it's it's like replacing syllables where the accent slides. Damn, so hard. And I and that is like basic dialogue editing. Essentially, what you're doing is looking for things that you can improve. Like if somebody is in the middle of a really nice scene, but they drop like some something falls off camera or something like that, or there's a bang, or mm -hmm. you know, if it's a, a exterior location, they don't have control over everything. There might be a horn honk or something like that. And I, I don't want to replace or we don't want to do ADR for great just the the one the one mistake. So I'll yeah. listen to the other the first thing I do is listen to the other takes to see can I just replace this little bit to fix this problem? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that that's basically what I do for the majority of my day is look to either organize sound or fix these kinds of small problems. Mm -hmm. We need to come intern with you because yeah. I like to see it. I've done that on the podcast and it's like kind of fun, but it's really hard. Yeah, <laughs> it, it takes time. Uh, you know, there's key syllables that you can transfer on that make it easier, like S's and T's are much, much easier. And so you just you look to you zoom right in close and you just look to line up the mod as much as you can find your cross point and you have to test it out. There's a lot of kind of sliding the the edit point around to, and then there can be speed changes that you need to make too. Like mm. if, if a line, the performance is the same, but it's delivered a little bit slower, we've got tools to kind of speed it up or slow it down to, to kind mm -hmm. of repair things that way. That's cool. I do a lot of that on The Handmaid's Tale. It's because I don't want to ADR very much. I'll, I'll spend a lot of time just looking to improve it with the production sound. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you um, met, mentioned accents, I was just going to ask The Handmaid's Tale has a lot of um, non-American <laughs> or Canadian actors. Yeah, non-American or Canadian actors. Do you have to work with them on their accents? Because I know, um, I think some of them have a, is it a dialogue coach or something like that? Do you have to work with them as well? And The only accent work I can remember doing is Yvonne hearing her own accent and flagging it and wanting to do something <laughs> To improve it she's got a pretty uh. she's got a pretty keen ear and when she's in occasionally she'll like oh i, I sound i sound i can hear the australian, australian there yeah can I, can I do that again and i can't hear it they're also good i have not heard it at all like yeah, i like, actually didn't know she was australian um and I think I watched her on Dexter and then something else. And then I found out she was Australian. I was like, oh my God, like I would never would have guessed. Yeah, she's like, she's all. got a, she's got good control over her yeah. over her voice. And she's a very, very fine actor. She's very skillful. She she's is amazing. Yeah. Yes. Um so that's you know, like with Joseph, um, no real accent work, um, OT. OT is interesting because when he's in Canada, he speaks with his American accent the whole time. all the time, the whole time. Yeah, wow. <laughs> and then I'll see him at a party and he'll go into his natural accent and I can't talk to him because it's like, <laughs> I, I don't know what you, I don't know what you just said. OT, like, but he, his method of, of helping him with his accent is to just be stay in, in, in his Amer stay in his American accent. Yeah. I mean, it's great. They all are. Max too. Like I didn't know he was British until we started you know, watching this closer and looking at interviews and I was yeah. like, oh, shit, he doesn't talk like that at all. Yeah. They, they, I think they do that work themselves and you know, I don't think I'm trying to remember if Max has ever flagged a line uh, for accent. I don't, I don't recall it. So it's not, it's not a big part of my, experience on that's um, amazing uh, I, I did a lot of it on the mini series alias grace uh oh. and and on women talking but uh, but it hasn't come up on handmaids much do a lot of actors stay in their accents have you noticed it's a bit of a mixed bag some do some don't i kind of can't tell what yvonne's doing until like a few words in. i don't know if it's some sort of mix between like being in america so long i definitely get australian when yvonne's in interviews yeah. but then sometimes i'll yeah. hear like american kind of words in there too it's like a hybrid i don't know 
Yeah. yeah she, she's got her own unique cadence to the way she speaks yeah. as well, which is, I think, part of the way that she acts. And I, I find it like her ability to kind of hold a camera and hold a moment and you wait uh -huh. for her to say the thing because she's just, uh -huh. I, I find her really, really interesting on camera. And I think like mm -hmm. what she was, what she got to do in season five was wonderful and she loved yes. it too. She yeah. was, we loved watching it. So. Yeah. She really enjoyed the art, the arc. Hit it out of the park this season. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so she really did. It's nice to see her outside of the same old, you know, yeah. Gilead life. And we were also a little tired of her being in jail. So it's good <laughs> yeah. that she got to do more. I year. was definitely yeah. tired of her being in jail. She wasn't being used. As fancy as her jail yeah. was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Bruce even, mm. I remember Bruce said in our interview that um, like Genevieve Wheeler, um, Genevieve Wheeler, <laughs> Genevieve, who plays Mrs. Wheeler um had like a very specific way of saying serena that like kind of changed how he wrote hmm. so it's cool that you know they have different ways of cadences if you will like you said good work yeah going back to adr i don't remember who it was someone mentioned like a traveling booth that you guys used i guess during covid yeah might have been wendy wendy might have mentioned that yeah we had two we did a few things in, we actually built a studio at lizzie's house in the the covid season oh that's smart right which was a, like a kind of mobile booth that we set up in one of the rooms in the house she was living in so all she had to do was literally walk in the microphone was set up uh, she had to turn the computer on but then everything was controlled by us from the studio that's awesome and she enjoyed it so much that she actually bought all of the equipment not <laughs> our not our booth but she got a list from our technical engineer of everything she needed uh -huh. and she built her own so that she could take it with her it's awesome. no we we're the only ones that have used it she hasn't had other films there. It, we used it on season four the end after she left toronto she wanted to because it was still kind of we were still in the covid window so she said mm -hmm. she got her booth set up for her but there was and i don't you know we haven't we didn't use it in season four but there is a mobile adr recording studio in toronto that was set up at the studio and i would go there to meet primarily it was with lizzie and uh, we would record but we started using that not in covid but um during season two, I recorded with Lizzie an audiobook of The Handmaid's Tale that she recorded for, I think it was Penguin in the UK. We originally planned that that was going to be like six four hour sessions or something like that. And it, we needed three times the amount of time to get through the book. Mm -hmm. And we were supposed to do it in this window when she wasn't shooting, and but it we got getting delayed and, and canceled. Long. And yeah. so I would go and work at this booth and then she would come and record book lines for us for 15 oh minutes in, co <laughs> in, in costume. costume. Like, there was one, there was one day where she was wearing her handmaids, her red, uh, down, yeah. down and she had blood on her face and <laughs> blood on her legs and like blood on her, and she came in it's like okay she sits down and i should have taken pictures yeah, of her, you and she's reading the book <laughs> that would be amazing. but in in this costume it was kind of crazy but we we haven't used we didn't use it in season five but yeah it was not convenient for me but great for her yeah <laughs> Have you done yeah. a lot of audiobook recording? I love that recording, by the way, that, that you did with her of the book. That's the only one I've ever done. You know, it, it was great to do that with Lizzie. It actually, we'd done season one together. And so reading the book after season one while in the middle of season two was very, very interesting, interesting yeah. for me to hear and for her to read. And there was a lot of chatter, but it also, we actually bonded quite a bit over that time. It's just like four hour sessions and we probably yeah. did 10 of them. So we spent a lot of time together and, and got comfortable together. And 
So when she's in Toronto, if she's recording ADR now for anything, she asks me to come. Doesn't that's matter awesome. what show it is. She's like, can you come to this session for me? What a high compliment. And that's really sweet. And uh, Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's, you know, I try to make contact with the people that she's working with so that they understand why I'm there. It's primarily just I think Lizzie likes the feedback I give her, which is fairly direct and honest. And yeah, she appreciates that there's a consistency. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I try not to impose myself on if there's another dialogue supervisor right. on the show, be respectful of their, you know, their, their work. It's like back up. This is yeah, my esen- job. <laughs> essentially, I'm, I'm back up to just to kind of make sure Lizzie is comfortable with what's happening. It's just to support her. But oh, do- doing nice. the book was a big part of that. Um, and then subsequently, you know, we've spent a lot of time together in studio at this point. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. She's lovely. She, yeah, I mean, she is a TV <laughs> TV star, and by that I mean she lives a life that is odd or hard to comprehend. Like the amount of hours and time she she spends working on the show. I, I don't know anyone that works harder than she does. Right, yeah. and it's a weird life, like getting driven everywhere, and she works all the time yeah as well of like food is just always there like we had a conversation about she misses doing groceries but she <laughs> just does doesn't have time to do groceries yeah. because if you're living in a house in another city it's not just groceries you need you need spices you need like, yeah you have no basics if you're gonna cook you need everything yeah right. all well, everything yeah she doesn't have time for it no like it, yeah yeah but she's a always in a good mood like always yeah. i always happy always enthusiastic about what people are doing Aww. she's a real enigma I, I, I like you said i just can't it's impossible to understand how she works as much as she yeah. does you know I, I i've asked her and she just looks like i don't know that's what i do <laughs> I <don't know>. yeah. <laughs> yeah obviously she enjoys it so that's great good yeah i was just wondering do you have a favorite um scene or even just a season or an episode that you enjoyed doing is there one that particularly sticks out to you as being your favorite that you edited well i'm gonna i'm gonna change the answer slightly because my favorite is never what i enjoyed doing Um, (laughs) okay yeah i i think what i'm most proud of in the in this five seasons would be well, there's two, I'll give you two stories. The first one is the um, milk tank to Chicago. Mm-hmm. Oh my God. That was <laughs> insane. It was insane for everyone. Uh, insane yeah. for the actors. Yeah. And, oh my God. And it was so hard. Again, another one of those scenes of like, I can't ask them to ADR this. <laughs> they're, they're literally in a sloshing tank of milk. <laughs> oh, like, I, sloshing is the word that comes to mind. Yeah. So I worked on that again. Same picture editor, very good friend of mine, Chris uh-huh. Donaldson, and I went to university together. We've known each other since we were in our early, in our early 20s. Oh, that's and, awesome. And, um, uh, he called and it's like, I don't know what's going to, what are you going to do with the scene? I don't know. I think you're going to have to ADR the scene. And there is some, there's definitely ADR in there. And I have, I did more for Maddie in that scene than for Lizzie, but it was a lot of work. And I yeah. think it sounds great. Now, when I hear it, it does, back, I was yeah. like, wow, is it ever good? Uh, and it was slow and methodical and Mm -hmm. you know one step at a time it's one of those scenes where i had no idea when i started i had no idea where i was going to get to or how i was going to get there and it's literally just one step at a time yeah i would say that well i don't even know i'd have to open it up to give you sort of percentages so that that is my kind of crowning achievement from i think Mm -hmm. it sounds great and it it was it was very hard but I think the most exhilarating moment that I ever had on the show was in season two, episode one. The opening is the hanging. Oh my god, the hanging. Yeah. Wow, yeah. It's almost mm-hmm. all ADR that sequence. Really? Except Aunt Lydia. Oh, all, yeah. mm-hmm. all, all of because there's no there's no recorded i mean they've recorded sound but there's nothing usable for they have oh. the masks on right yeah. we, we've got close-ups and like multiple cameras there's yeah. nothing basically for the whole opening eight minutes there was no dialogue that was usable except aunt lydia and i, I had mapped it all out we'd done all of the the main characters except lizzie except june and 
is very specific and very detailed, but June was just kind of, she's omnipresent in the show. And so I mapped it all out, kind of like I put cues in and would the cues allow the actor to know when they're either supposed to speak or when they're on camera. And mm -hmm. there, we use a, a wipes that go across the screen like this, or, and we use beeps that cue them and a rhythm. So mm. it's beep, 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 line. Mm. Oh, that's interesting. And so for, for June, there were 40 for this uh, section. And we talked through it. Lizzie has an incredible memory. So she knows the drama extremely well. And she said, well, let's just start. Let's just start. And I had it all mapped out and we did, we hit play and she recorded eight minutes in one take. Wow. Oh my God. The, the whole thing. And I just kind of kept looking at my sheets, looking at the screen <laughs> and looking at her and looking at the scene Jesus. and she was just doing it. And she was like, sh she knew it. She was nailing it. That's unbelievable. And I kept thinking no I was going to, I was going to have to stop and didn't stop and I was like I was waiting for her to run out of energy or breaths or like it's yeah. tiring and she didn't and we got to the end and end of literally the end of the scene and so we stopped and she looked at me I was sitting like just a few feet from her at this point <laughs> and she looked down and she's like how was that <laughs> and I was oh like my God. fucking incredible and she said <laughs> Good, because I don't want to do it again. <laughs> yeah. How can she? I. How can someone remember eight minutes? Wow, that's. Just, I don't know. A, wow, that's impressive. I don't know. That's a, I, crazy. Uh, I mean, there's not a lot of dialogue in it, but there's constant emotion. And yeah. She's, and she not only she had to put her own mask on. She put the mask on during the ADR to recording. Record. So she's she started without <laughs> the mask, and oh, then she wow. sort of went and put it on and. And we continued the second half of it without it. She's so badass, man. Yeah, it was like, Maybe. and I didn't, you know, this was the first session of the second yeah. season. I didn't know her that well at that point right. in time. Just we'd only done the one season together. So it wasn't like we had a, a, a really good shorthand. And it was just mesmerizing to see to her watch. do that. And yeah, and it's great too. I, I love that scene. I love the, yeah, it's, it's it is, I think the best. Yeah. There's a few like this is the best we've ever done scenes, and yeah. that's that's one of them. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. How do you? When does the music like? Do you work with the music being added? Not, in not really. I mean, most of the music work is being sorted out by the music supervisor and uh, the picture editors mm -hmm. along the way. And Bruce, Bruce has a really strong opinion about the music and want, wants to if it doesn't work for him it doesn't get in the show mm. the, the directors often all bring music ideas as well um i don't know that i hear all of those because i don't necessarily see the director's cuts i usually start on an episode sometime after bruce has done his pass on it and it's gone to the network mm -hmm. the music stays in flux through all of that whether it's adam or if they want to use a song there's a debate can they get the song and yeah how much how much is the song going to cost that was another thing in the screeners that changed yeah notably from the screeners to the final and and sometimes that's because bruce doesn't like he wants to change something is sometimes they either just can't get the rights or it's too expensive yeah. or, or, you know, and so often the screeners are going out well before that much thought has been put into it. Yeah. Um, there are times when there's music on something because Adam hasn't had time to score it and the, you know, they, they know they want to use score, but they don't have any score yet. So mm -hmm. yeah, that happens in the birth scene, I think. They were using like um, an old Nick and June score, so we noticed yeah. and mentioned it in our episode, and then it was changed. By the it was time changed. It came yeah. yeah, I mean the picture editors do all have Adam's scores from earlier, but they've mm -hmm. been tr they've been trying over the course of every season to modify the music as they go and allow it to have its own transition yeah in, it's changed right. um so you, you you can't just grab material from episode right. one of season one and know that it's going to work and a funny little nuance in season one after season one i cataloged everything i recorded with lizzie and i actually do it with all of the actors that's non-verb non-words i build uh -huh. a library of breaths and efforts and sounds for them <laughs> and uh i've been carrying that forward lizzie's is huge like I, I was gonna say, I it's so big 
Uh, and it's, it's primarily because I, I, we hear her a lot, mm -hmm. but I can't get enough time to record all of that with her. Right. So yeah. I'll use, I'll try to build things with library where I can, but I found in season five that I can't, I can't do it because it's not the right sounds. The character wouldn't be making these sounds any longer. Mm -hmm. And Lizzie, Lizzie knows this. So I play it for her all the time. Like nothing really goes past. I, I want her approval on stuff. And we do joke about it sometimes too, of like, let's come on into the studio and we'll grab some stuff, you know, for the library. <laughs> uh, but I found that I couldn't do it in season five because the sounds were just of yeah. June, June season one is just, she's not making the same sounds. No. She's so different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Like you're working with her on the performance too, you know, on like, this doesn't match with the character at this point in the story. And yeah, I mean, a big, I, I think a big part of my job is trying to bring the performance forward as much as I can. Mm -hmm. um, so when I'm making a change to something, it is to enhance performance. Mm -hmm. And we do, we talk about it in the context of sound, like I'm fixing a bump, but I'm fixing the bump because the bump distracts from the performance. Yeah. So for me, everything that I do is about protecting or reconstructing or constructing the actor's performances. And the tools that I have start with the choices the actor made, the choices the picture editor made, and then the choices that we might make together. And there are lots of times, like Lizzie's so good at ADR, we'll often do one or two takes and then like, well, let's do a few and try it different ways now. We got what we had before. Let's right, try right, some right. try something new to see could this scene be different? Could it is there a more interesting way to play it? But it it, it is like I I started my career as a sound effects editor wanting to work in sound design because I was really interested in sound for cinema, sound for screen. Mm -hmm. But after about 10 years I realized like what I love most is drama and storytelling and that's in the dialogue, the storytelling, the working with the actors, the working with the directors and the picture editors is working with the dialogue. So mm -hmm. while a lot of what I do is technical, I think of it as performance related and dramatic drama. Yeah, definitely. Going back to what you were saying about Lizzie doing the, the eight minute take in the, the hanging scene, that reminded me of her testimony scene, the single take or the single shot. Did you have to do a lot of work on that? Nothing. Not, nothing. That that scene took 10 minutes to edit. Wow. <laughs> Pre press play, stop a couple times, get to the end. It was perfectly recorded Amazing. and it was perfectly performed. There was nothing to do. Was the funeral difficult? Uh, in season five, uh, there's, no, there's no dialogue. Although, like, here's just a little thing of like, what's Lizzie's line? What's June's line at the end? What the fuck? Is that what she says? What the fuck? Yeah. Uh, that's, that's ADR. Nice. <laughs> 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 my favorite sound scenes this season are like the little the two olive speech to june and luke then like into nick walking into lawrence's and punching lawrence like his footsteps and the score also to olive speech like they're all just so good those are my favorite scenes sound wise with everything coming together love it but you're right like the music has changed like so much since earlier seasons yeah especially, like towards the end of the season <laughs> i had a chat with adam at the uh, episode 10 uh, premiere in Los Angeles, which I went down for. And um, oh, that's awesome. it was neat to chat with him. He was talking about his own challenges of skills he's had to develop and learn and the things that he's been, you know, wanting and trying to do over the course of it. He was Reed's uh, suggestion and selection for composer. Oh, yeah. And I think mm -hmm. it was a little bit of a, like, uh, he was a bit of unknown for something like this at the time time but he just nailed like that yeah. first first episode the his score was is yeah. so iconic now oh my mm -hmm. God. but you know and i think that's the kind of thing he's he's good at and is kind of known for but he talked about needing to become a more a better player a better piano player a better guitar player oh. it was interesting to hear him talk about his own process as well about improving and challenging himself right. along, over the course of time I mean, that's incredible about, you know, the whole team seems like that, right? They're all trying to, yeah. even though they are like so phenomenal to us and mind-blowing, everybody's still trying to improve as they go. And it's just, 
It shows. It must be uh, cool to actually see everyone. I'm guessing you don't really see that many people when you're yeah. editing. So going to a premiere and stuff, you get to socialize. <laughs> yeah, it, um, a bit. Like I, I actually know the actors and yes, yeah. and very few. Like I know Bruce, but I had to introduce myself to the writers, uh, Eric and Yelin. Mm, yeah, and you know it's great to know the actors but trying to talk to them at a party is just ridiculous like forget <laughs> it. Uh, yeah. especially a gala event like that like they're working yeah. and yeah. everyone there was literally a procession line 50 people deep to talk to lizzie and wow at one point she was kind of not there and her assistant grabbed me he's like come come talk to lizzie so i went, oh. went over <laughs> and so i you know chatted with L lizzie briefly at the event because i was about to leave but it is kind of fun but i kind of wish there were a few more torontonians there i was there because lizzie wanted me to qc the mix oh, and, right. yep. uh, to make to make sure the presentation was correct oh, she wants to take you everywhere with her <laughs> if there's something sound related she she does rely on me me for that it's actually more appropriate that it would be lou or joe that would go to something like that because they're the mixing engineers she would have been fine if they went but neither of them could go and so she was happy that i was able to go yeah mm -hmm. i heard that she said that like and somebody's like, that, this is exhausting for you, that event. Like, do you want to come take a break? And she's like, no, like, I, this is why I wanted to come. Like, she likes to talk to the fans and do that. And that's really nice. She's, she's too good to be true. There is a bit of that for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Let me bring over. There's just a few people. While we're waiting, I did see that. Are you a big, like, record fan? Uh, I wouldn't consider myself to be in the standard uh, of record collecting record people i'm modest but i do uh, i am very interested in home audio and uh high-end audio and turntables and records and stuff like that yeah do you have a collection or i, I mean my collection's modest it's like in the hundreds compared to oh, well, that's like, pretty good. you know hardcore record collectors I'm impressed. Uh, you know i own a modest amount of records but i do listen to them yeah, the sound on them is just, yeah, you can't get that, can you? It's great. Hi, Tina's here. It didn't bring my video over for some reason. All right, we see your Mickey Mouse ears, so it's all good. <laughs> yeah. Oh, do you? <laughs> <laughs> so, hi, David. Thank you for joining us. No problem. So, my question was, how much of the process when you're recording the ADR, would you say, is work you do, or like you mentioned, the splicing in, like, certain syllables, um, compared to what the actors have to do, like, if they have to enunciate or whisper, you know, raise their voice. Um, is it like a mix of that sometimes when you say when you're recording or is it more one or the other? It's definitely a mix. The, you know, there's a number of reasons why we would need to record something. And, you know, I try to keep the number of technical things that I ask the actors to do to a minimum as much as I possibly can and stay focused on things that are also interesting to them. But they are respectful of when I need something like an example of a scene in season five, episode 10, when Tuello and June are talking in the kitchen with Luke and Moira and the baby halfway through the scene off camera, the baby starts screaming and <laughs> the, the Moira, Moira brings the the baby into the scene the dial from about a third into the scene the dialogue is unusable the production sound is unusable mm. so we transition into ADR in the middle of that scene and that's that was mostly Sam but uh Lizzie and Samira and OT all had lines in there as well to replace them um because we literally can't hear anything uh wow. that the actors are saying i had to like comb through the microphones and go through the script to kind of know what they'd actually said <laughs> the, all, so all of the actors are obviously like yeah we have to do that that's no problem so they're pretty agreeable in terms of it working the, the whether the adr works or not i really do credit the actors for giving performances that are seamless to integrate into the show like i've got lots of skill and tricks and tools to kind of integrate it but if the performance and the tempo pitch uh and the honesty of it don't if the actor doesn't deliver that then it doesn't work so 
I do think the actors get most of the credit for the quality of the ADR on the show. They trust me to build the map. I kind of think of dialogue editing as it's like cartography. The first thing you do is you got to build your map and then you got to create a path through the map. And that's my job. And they give me these, these tools to kind of help that. But I don't think there's like, you can say it's one thing or another. The show is a little bit weird in the way the production sound gets recorded. So it's pretty, it can be different why we might need to do something, you know, does that answer the question? Yes, it does. And I, I, I would have never guessed that scene with the baby was ADR. And we were when we were talking about doing this interview, Kate was asking for examples of sound. And we were like, well, if he does ADR, I was like, typically, I only notice that when it's very, very bad. Yeah. And I, I yeah. never notice it on because there have been examples on other shows I watch. Where I'm like, oh, I can tell that was recorded somewhere else. So you're astounding at what you do. It's incredible. Well, thank you. You're very welcome. You can tell that a lot on... Um like reality shows and stuff like that when they're trying to build drama like right. you can tell something's been like put in there and I'm like that totally wasn't done then come on guys yeah <laughs> and like I said I never notice it I never notice it on handmade so incredible no. incredible work you do I, yeah I think if we if you can notice it Bruce won't let us use it so yeah in air, okay. in time at times when we we've had ADR that doesn't work. It, we just, it doesn't get to the end. And I, I know that ADR can sometimes get a bit of a bad rap. Um, people will talk about it negatively or they don't like it or they feel like it's not authentic. And I don't think of it that way at all. I, I actually think it's like a chance to only make the show better. better um, yeah. yeah. It's like free takes. Um, yeah. It's a lot um, more affordable than shooting. Yeah. So, right. so sure. you, the act, the actors get a chance to do things again. Um, the, the bad decision is using ADR that doesn't work. It's not, it's not choosing to try to record the ADR to begin All with. Right. And there have been many times on our show when we don't know if something's going to work or it's, you know, it's weird, it's difficult, it's hard. And then we record it and it's like, yeah, it's great. And, you know, um, Lizzie, for example, is very open to like, she's like, oh, I don't, I can't, that's really good. I, uh, let's try it, but I don't know. And then records it and it's like, oh, that was good. Let's use that. Um, <laughs> so I think that on our show, we don't put in bad ADR uh, very huh. often. It's occasionally like, because we have to, but we really just don't use it. If it doesn't work, we don't use it. Very cool. Cool. Thank you. No problem. Jan, are you there? Hi, David. Um, Hi. It's great to see you or to meet you. You too. So my question is, um, I know you mentioned about obviously the actors um, re-recording lines. Um, is it pretty common that most of the actors will have to do some ADR re-recording like during the season and like is it common that maybe they'd have to be like called back like once they you know once the season's over to do that or do you kind of do that your job like as the season is filming um we generally start in sound about two-thirds of the way through production maybe halfway through production so in that window of time a lot of the actors are in toronto still but our work definitely continues after they wrap shooting and the actors have all left so mm -hmm. for the first half of a season most of them would record their adr in toronto and for the second half of the season they can be all over the world um mm -hmm. whether it's you know the common studios where we would end up recording are in new york in los angeles and or in london um, and that's generally where our actors go after they've finished shooting, mm -hmm. um, if they're if they're no longer in Toronto. And I would say usually it's like the last two to three episodes, they're gone by the time we're in post-production. And we'll try to record with them before they leave. So like if we know Max is leaving town on a particular date, we'll comb through episodes in advance to kind of see, we're going to bring them in one more time, what might we need, and we'll try to record that. So we try to be efficient about their time and, and what we ask of them. But it is very common that the actors will be recording after they've left the city. And in terms of how much we do and like, Lizzie obviously does ADR, I would say, every episode. There's been a handful of episodes in the five seasons where we haven't needed to record with her, but I would say it's pretty standard that we need to record with her. And it, mm -hmm. how much we record can change from two to three lines to 
50. Everyone else is really dependent on what's happening in the episodes, and there is no predictable pattern of what I'll need or, or how much I'll need for any of them. It really depends on what they've shot. Mm-hmm. Are all the um the baby sounds of baby um Nicole? Is that the baby or is that you? Um we so we use the baby's sounds as much as we can. Mm-hmm. And what I'll do is I'll go in and pull them out of a scene and then I'll get all of the other takes and send all of that to the sound effects department. And so they'll have our baby uh, as much as possible, but then if they don't have the sounds that they need, then they'll use other baby other recordings. Babies. <laughs> and um, yeah, because sometimes you want to change it. Like the baby might not be totally acting the way you want the baby to be acting. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Sometimes it's great, and they they'll adjust. Like an example of where a scene adjusted in season five, episode two, when. June goes upstairs to they're they're giving Nicole a bath. Mm-hmm. That scene was written completely different than what was what they ended up shooting. I think mm-hmm. uh, June was supposed to go in while they were getting Nicole ready and then take over the bath and give her a bath. Uh, give her a bath. <laughs> yeah. And the the baby, the child was like no wanted no part of oh, the bath. Well, go away. <laughs> I like how it went. So yeah. what and it and they literally just like on the fly changed changed it whereas yeah. june mm-hmm. lizzie lifted the baby out and and held no. her and she's calmed down so it's like so that's what they filmed and that's how the scene went it's like it's not about the bath it's about the emotion of the baby it also works mm-hmm. for the show like as far as you know yeah. bodily autonomy goes and saying yeah. you don't have to take this bath i'm not going to force you into this bath you know in a show where women are forced to shit so it worked really well way to go lizzie but in episode 10 we changed the baby entirely because what we had there was absolute screaming, like <laughs> blow the microphones out. Oh, like, and Bruce was like, can we tone, like, let's tone it down a little bit. And uh, so it's a much calmer, even though the baby's still crying and is yeah. very loud, it's like maybe 30% of what was there in the production sound. Really? Babies yeah. have to be pretty hard to work with. So. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, and they're, you know, they're babies. They're not actors. Ooh. Yeah. We did hear the baby was a bit of a a crier, but she was very cute. So. Well, there were two. There were two <laughs> twins. They usually use yes, twins. Yes, that's right. Yeah. And one of them was a crier, and one of them wasn't. Um, but oh. you know, they can't just use mm. the non-crier. They have to use them both. And there are lots of times when it's appropriate. You know, it's like this. It's fine that the baby's upset. Yeah, we want the baby to cry. We'll switch in the cry. The yeah, cry. Exactly. baby that cries a lot. Cry baby. Oh. Less. Speaking of children that you have to get to, my daughter Kaya wrote me a list of eight questions for you. I'm just going to okay. ask one because I promised her I would. What is your favorite color? <laughs> yeah, it's actually so funny. I'll read them all. You can pick one. Is making dialogue fun? What is your favorite show or movie to dialogue? Is making dialogue all it was cut out to be? Have you done dialogue your whole life? What was the first show you ever dialogued? How many other shows have you dialogued? <laughs> Did you originally want to be dialoguing The Handmaid's Tale? <laughs> Have you ever been on a show or doing something on a set other than a dialogue? <laughs> I love yeah. like she used to die. <laughs> this is so cute. Uh, I have not dialogued my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, I kind of discovered I, I discovered sound for picture in university. And what university? You said you went. With I went to Oxford. Queen's University is on in Kingston, Ontario, and I study. I started studying film there while studying drama i think i wanted to be an actor but i wasn't very good and (laughs) while there i started to discover sound i i I had been interested in sound but i hadn't put it together as something that happened in film and television Mm -hmm. Uh, and it was at university where i was kind of like oh these things like sound is a part of screened content big part yeah and Mm -hmm. i became more and more curious about it and so when I finished school, I was like curious to work in sound and it was more sound effects editing than dialogue at that time. And it was, you know, I was about 10 years in where I decided I wanted to learn how to dialogue edit. it. It was, and it was mm-hmm. primarily at the, that time, my interest was because my partner, Jane, 
is a sound designer and a supervising sound editor and she's she's more experienced senior to me but i was my career was advancing and i was reaching the point where i was going to have a hard time working with her on the same projects because yeah. we didn't need two of us so if i wanted to keep working with jane and she was the one getting the really good projects not me <laughs> if i wanted to keep working with her then i I felt I needed a new skill set. I needed to expand my skill set. So mm -hmm. I started to. Yeah, that's so interesting. That's really... I started to work on dialogue primarily on independent Canadian films and short films where I just wanted to learn, learn this skill. Mm -hmm. right. And then slowly I became, you know, as I discovered that this is where the drama was happening, it became, became more and more interested in it. I still occasionally do sound effects, but I find that dialogue is the thing that I'm more interested in. I actually think I'm probably better at it than I was as a sound effects editor. And that worked out really nicely. Yeah. Trying to remember some of the other questions that were in there. <laughs> what was your favorite show or movie to dialogue is a good one. Um, I don't know, favorite. I mean, Handmaid's Tales in the list because I think it might be the best actual show that I've yeah. worked on. The quality so good, yeah. You know, I, I really loved the show I did before uh, Handmaid's Tale, which was Penny Dreadful. Um, oh, yeah. Cool. And uh, that was a very difficult dialogue edit as well. And I feel like I really improved my skills over the course of the three seasons of working on it. But, you know, I, I think that currently, like, the best work I've ever done was women talking in terms of overall quality of sound for mm -hmm. film. And, and obviously, dialogue's a pretty important part of that. The sound mm -hmm. of that movie a lot of the sound people from handmaids went right or worked on that as well yeah i mean uh, pretty much the same crew that's awesome though i love that you guys do that well it's like the sound people i've worked with sarah a long time as has jane yeah. um and so we we're actually i would say we're her sound people first mm -hmm. uh, because the relationship predates the the one yeah, but she doesn't she doesn't direct all that often. And I, I, I don't work with that many different people. It's a pretty small world. Uh, I hire Kristen <laughs> whenever I can. I don't, you know, we don't work on everything together, but I, if I can hire a dialogue editor, she's my first choice. Yeah. Do you guys, what about like office space? Like do all the sound people work in the same we office? We used to. We we used to, but we don't. COVID kind of sent a lot of people home. Yeah. And so I spend probably 90% of my time now at home. Wow. And I think a lot of people have gotten comfortable with it, like just saving travel time. <laughs> yes. right. And yeah. um, I do miss the kind of camaraderie. I miss the ability to train people. That's a mm -hmm. real weakness that we've got now because we're not spending time together. Right. Yeah. And our studio has gone through some changes too. So we just don't have as many rooms or as, as much space for, for sound editorial as we used to. So mm -hmm. fewer people are in this are in the office, but I obviously have to go in when we're mixing. Sometimes I have to go in if we're recording ADR. I do a lot of ADR from zoom as well, mm -hmm. but I, I, you know, I do miss the, the camaraderie, but I, I've got a better computer at home than I had at the studio anyway. <laughs> yeah. So That's I kind true. of can do more here than I can there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We got rid of our office. I work in finance. Boring. But saves them. we learned we could save a lot of money during COVID. So yeah, that happened yeah. to a lot of people. This is totally random, but I saw that you worked on American Psycho and I really liked that movie. <laughs> that's was that really early on in your sound was not, career or? yeah that was 99 i think i was oh. one of the sound effects editors on american psycho what was it like working on that with the sound effects if you remember <laughs> it's like two decades ago now yeah i remember i mean it was like we were just starting to work in surround sound so there w it was a kind of like trying to explore things anew the movie was interesting. <laughs> you know, I, I actually, you know, I know I was like, I think it was like, it was a, a bigger movie than I think I was necessarily ready to contribute an awful lot to, mm -hmm. um, even though like, I wouldn't have thought that at the time I would have been completely comfortable, but I look at it now and I look at like who was in the movie and I look at how the movie sounds, um, I feel like it was like, it's one of those movies that I wish I was doing 
five to 10 years later when yeah. I think mm -hmm. my, my skills and my expertise have had improved. And I think it was, you know, it was a pretty stressful film um, to work on. Mary at the time, even though she was Canadian, would wanted to be working in, in New York. She, she had done her last film in New York. She was living in New York. She didn't really want to be in Toronto. So we actually did work with some people at a company called C5, which doesn't exist anymore, but was one of the top sound editorial houses in New York. Mm -hmm. They had worked with Mary, so they did some work and sent us sound effects and kind of gave us the New York, a lot of New York energy mm -hmm. to help. Uh, augment the the movie i mean it's it, it is a bit of a weird movie and like the sound <laughs> is it's very interior in patrick's head and there's yeah. a lot of music so mm -hmm. those are the kind of main drivers there's actually not a lot of sound effects like i remember the chainsaw being a really big deal yeah mm -hmm. uh and a few other kind of like abstract odd sounds but again these are all very it's all very subjective and you know, I remember trying to get the sound. We went to record a pig to try to get the sound of the little pig that um, <laughs> yeah. uh, Reese Witherspoon characters carrying around with her. And it was like, <laughs> we're in a pig pen and we can't get the pig, can't pick it up. And a couple of Jane and I, and like we're from the city and the farm guys <laughs> laughing at us as we're trying, like, well, go ahead, go to try to get the pig. They weren't, they wouldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> and so anyway, it's like um, I've had people ask me about American Psycho in the past because the film culturally has penetrated. It mattered. Mm -hmm. um, but I I don't have a, like a an amazing answer. And ironically, I did work with um, Mary again because she directed uh, Alias Grace that Sarah Pauli produced. And so we spent time talking about that experience as well and i kind of got her perspective on it and it was kind of interesting to hear because i think the movie was complicated for her too mm -hmm. you know what it what would you do to get to work on a movie with a young christian bale before the guy yeah. was was mm -hmm. really really like who he is now i think mm -hmm. he was well known but i that was a a big role yeah. for him at the time. Like, mm -hmm. I kind of wish I had appreciated it more, but you know, I don't know. You don't. didn't know. Mm -hmm. yeah. You didn't know. No. Alias Grace um, is also Margaret Atwood, right? Yes. Yeah. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. What are you, um, are you working at the moment? Are you working on anything at the moment? Uh, most of my time is on a TV series for Netflix called Valhalla. Or, which is oh, a Vikings yeah. okay. a Vikings mm -hmm. spinoff. Mm -hmm. It's the same. It's the same actual producer that uh, that I work for on The Handmaid's Tale, which is Sheila Hawking, is the oh, yeah. mm -hmm. producer in charge of post production, and mm -hmm. she's an executive producer on Handmaids and an executive producer on Valhalla. She's the one that's responsible for hiring us, and I've been working with her for a long time. Um, I can still remember. We were finishing Penny Dreadful and we're a little disappointed that Penny Dreadful was ending. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we were kind of, nope, the public didn't know this season, the show was ending, but we did. And we were finishing up, I think maybe the very last episode and I was in the hallway with Sheila. We always have a big wine and cheese and gathering mm -hmm. after our mm -hmm. last playback and Sheila and I were in the hallway and I said, you know, I'm going to miss this show. I, I, this show has been great. And she said, yeah, I I will too. I feel like it's ending a bit early, but there's something else coming that I think might be a worthy replacement. And I said, what is it? And she said, it's an adaptation of The Handmaid's Tale with Elizabeth Moss. And I just my, I just dropped. I was like, that'll work. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, that sounds good. And um, my wife, she has spent a lot of time working in literature and theater and actually has a doctoral wrote a doctoral thesis at mm. university of toronto on adaptation oh, and, wow. and one of her one of the uh, subjects within her dissertation is the handmaid's tale well, so this amazing. was a this was a text that she knew cool. extremely well. Well. <laughs> and yeah. i remember i came home with the lookbook that had been presented and i yeah. said natalie have a look at this and she looked at it and and there i can remember her kind of like just slowly getting closer and closer to the computer. <laughs> and she was really 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 enthusiastic because oh, yeah. that's awesome you know, yeah um so she was That's like cool. she would watch the episodes with me 
while I was working on them. Just, yeah. And then she stops like, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I have to see it. I have to see it. <laughs> um, so there was a, you know, a transfer of excitement into the Handmaid's Tale alongside Sheila. So yeah. uh, we're working on Valhalla together now and um, cool. it'll, it'll be a while before the next Handmaid season starts. Um, yeah. So we're hoping to mm-hmm. do at least one other show in between as well. Yeah. Awesome. How early on in season one did you guys know it was going to continue? Where it was going to go more than one season? Yeah. I think everyone knew this was going to go. It was just immediately. Yeah. yeah Evident, like, as you're filming it, this is a huge deal. Yeah. And I, I don't think Bruce ever intended to only write one season. Uh, right. I think everyone knew this show was going to work. I don't think we great. knew how, how well it was going to work. I don't think we yeah. knew the political you didn't know yeah. trump was gonna win. actually but you could you could see it coming though like as we were working on it we knew the world was shifting and the mm-hmm. show hadn't, and the show hadn't come out yet and you could kind of see like man this is gonna matter um and the you know the first three episodes like reed's episodes are mind-blowingly good no. yeah so i we all could see that and obviously you know lizzie's lizzie right she, <laughs> yeah. she, that didn't she, hurt having lizzie no no and she loves the show like she's yeah yeah Mm -hmm. yeah. so definitely i i don't think we knew how many seasons but i i i feel like you know we're gonna get six and i kind of think that's about maybe like maybe bruce had been thinking five i'm not you know i'm not totally sure where his his head was at because he always you know they talked about it but never know if it's going to get funded or not right but certainly i think he's up for writing this show i think he he feels right. like he could he could stay in this world and tell this story for a long time. I think he's going to. Yeah. Testaments. Yeah. Testaments, I think, is supposed to uh, follow. Yeah. So it's pretty nice for everybody that works on the show to with that she wrote the sequel. Yeah. I would be excited. Have you read um, the Testaments, David? No, I haven't yet. I will, but I wanted to finish Handmaid's Tale before yeah. yes. reading the Testaments. I, I have yeah. it. It's like on my shelf. Yeah. Um, <laughs> For the, for the day you wrap six, you're ready. Yeah, my my wife read it. Um, I haven't read it yet. I was just so, you know, I could probably read it now that there's quite a ways before we do a, um, a short season six, but um, it just hasn't been on my, my on my radar yet. Although, mm-hmm. you know, it does get talked about fairly regularly and I do talk with um, the actors about it and occasionally and stuff. They don't know that much um, about what's going on. It's all in the business world still at this point in time. Yes. So do you know like the major things that happen in the book or what, what won't happen in the show because yeah, of the book? Yeah. Right. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. That sometimes is debated too. Of Like oh, the Margaret's written us to here now and we want to go to there too. So we can't diverge yeah. too, too much, mm-hmm. but that's all stuff that Bruce and the writers yeah. sort, sort out. Uh, sometimes they argue with the directors and, <laughs> and stuff about things they can and can't do based yeah. on it, but it doesn't, you know, maybe like once or twice a season, it's not a big deal. I'd be so yeah. fascinated to know where he would have gone with it without having that bookend written, you know, the end, which we'll never know, obviously. But would have been I don't think Aunt Lydia yeah. would have had a redemption arc. No, I don't think she would have survived, probably. I, I don't I don't know, because I, you know, I've talked with Anne quite a bit about Lydia. And the one thing that is, you know, that I find interesting is that um, I think Anne agrees with this. And this is just my opinion on Lydia, but Lydia is the most earnest character on the show. She believes what in what she's doing, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. as much as anyone. Like to yeah. her bones, she yeah. believes that this is the right thing to be doing. Yeah, and she's helping them. And she thinks that she's doing good for the world. Uh-huh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so I actually think that the only you know, unless Gilead wins. And we kind of know from the book that Gilead doesn't win. Yeah, even from the yeah, um, initial book. You, you know, from the original book that Gilead's time is short-lived. I actually think the only arc Lydia can go on is one where her worldview collapses. Mm-hmm. Because she's yeah. not out for power or gain. She's not going to manipulate the system to serve something that she wants politically right. or mm-hmm. economically or whatever. She believes in the spirit of it. And when the corruption yeah. around her starts to crumble, yeah. she's not going to accept that. Right. Because she's so invested yeah. in 
the righteousness of her worldview. So mm -hmm. when she sees that, now that she's accepting it, yeah, the corruption. Yeah, she's not going to go with it. Um, because you know, Anne, this is a hard character for Anne to play and invest in. But you know, knowing that that she, her intentions are always genuine, which you can't say about everyone else. Like there's a lot of other characters that are pretty manipulative yeah. at times. Yeah. But I, mm -hmm. I just don't think Lydia is. Yeah. No, that's, that's a good explanation. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's really interesting. I find it. I enjoy Yvonne's like take on Serena when um, yeah. a lot, a lot of the fans are like, she's redeemed or she's gonna, you know, and Yvonne's like, just like very, she's like, no, she's in it for herself. She's always motivated by herself. You know, if it works for her, sure, she'll do whatever Yeah, yeah. might look good at the moment. But I don't know, I like, you have to be able to convince yourself of your char character's motives, obviously, but you don't necessarily have to convince yourself that like your villain is a yeah. protagonist or a good guy, right? I like how yeah, she has that distance. She definitely has a, th a very thorough understanding of, um, of her character. No doubt about that. Serena yeah. is... Yvonne knows Serena pretty well and knows her vices and her weaknesses and knows mm -hmm. how manipulative she can be yeah. or is, is willing to be. Um, I think there was complexity for Serena in season five because I think she genuinely starts to question her worldview, but it's mm -hmm. motivated by a selfishness. Of, yeah. I, mm -hmm. I have this child now and I can't go back there. I think she would have gone back to Gilead in a heartbeat if they would have created terms Definitely. for her to stay mm -hmm. right. but once that became not an option for her i think the experience of being with the wheelers uh, with the wheelers it had a strong effect on her worldview mm -hmm. um, on, but only because the shoe was on the other foot yeah um, exactly yeah it was happening so to her, it's, right. it's not like she had a reckoning of like oh my god i can't believe she was just like no this doesn't work for <laughs> this doesn't work for me, for me. Yeah. 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 i don't like this <laughs> yeah, i, don't, I yeah. don't like this who's your favorite character david on the show oh my favorite character i don't know um <laughs> who's your favorite character Kimberly? that's a good question uh Overall, maybe Lawrence. Oh, yeah. That's what I would have guessed. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to separate myself from just a th thorough, this show is June's show. Yeah. Uh, you know, what, what I think I like about The Handmaid's Tale is that it really doesn't allow you to be stable in your expectation of what's going to happen. Bruce and the writers always come up with something that I didn't expect or didn't see. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, at, at one point I said, I started saying to people, ah, Tuello's leaking information. He's he's a bad guy. Yeah, I didn't like Tuello for a while. I started speculating that because about episode eight, I'm like, too many things are happening. Like I read spy novels and, and crime novels and it's like, too many things are happening that Tuello's directly involved with. I, I bet you he's... And and I said that to a few people and they looked at me like, you're crazy. Tuello's the only... <laughs> Um, <laughs> but I, I did have this thing of like, I bet you Tuello's the one that's like, he's he's the reason the raid failed and he's selling, right. he's selling out. Yeah, we don't know why the raid failed. But I, I don't, that comment didn't get past very many it people. didn't age well. <laughs> well, it's just like, whoever I said it to, I was like, no, no, that's <laughs> not, that's not. But, you know, who knows where the show kind of goes. Like it would be, you would be heartbroken and like, if for yes. the show to like all of a sudden you found out Tuello was betraying June. Oh, I'd be so oh devastated. God, yeah. I'd yeah. be so. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that was why I started thinking. Oh, you know, it's like yeah, they can't. There can't be anybody good on this show. Like, they, they <laughs> yeah. all. So Tuello's gonna, and I, I think I mentioned it to Sam, and he was kind of like, "Oh, I hope not." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've all like so, started to become huge fans of him, like from season five. So it would be, yeah, please don't do that. <laughs> I, yeah. yeah, yeah, Sam's good. He's a, he's a nice guy. If that happens, you can change his ADR. Just like put some different words in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have one last sound question. It's not dialogue, but like, how much of the sound effects are computer like? You have a saved siren on the computer or dogs barking, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sure you use that. But like, I remember seeing, I think Kira commented on our Twitter when we were doing um, a season one episode and said that um, when June was shaving her legs, was Fred shaving her legs? Ugh. Yes, Fred. Anyway, she said that the sound effect was made by like a razor and a cantaloupe, I think. 
something to that effect. How, how often do you do like weird real life objects to make sounds? Um, it's almost never, very rarely would it be computer driven or where the sound would be created. Uh, like Brennan, our sound designer, does do a lot of musical tonal sounds, which he might uh, manipulate using utilities in a computer, but we're almost always starting with something originally recorded. Mm -hmm. uh, so like what are some other weird things can you think of any like the, the arm breaking in season five was uh yeah like that got that got a lot of attention and he he wrote a a write-up about it let me see if i can find it because he sent it to lizzie and lizzie sent it to me uh with a note uh, let me see if i can find it because she thought it was the craziest thing she she <laughs> was doing an interview and somebody asked her about the arm break and so she texted brennan about it and and then she was so oh she, yeah i think we might have saw that yeah yeah so so brennan's response to it was the, the arm breaking sound was a mixture of animal bone plant and vegetable matter <laughs> in it, different fruits and vegetables are put under stress and broken these sounds can be pitched down to make them sound heavier and more gruesome this arm break sound is specifically made up of carrot and a raw chicken carcass <laughs> grapefruit and kelp and then a banana tree uh to help create the sort of fleshy thing so oh my god that um, is wild. What an interesting job. That is so, funny. And, you know, for the, for fights and bone breaks, like... Yeah, Lawrence got punched. What was that? Uh, when Lawrence got punched by Nick? Oh, I don't actually don't know that that was augmented all that much. Like, we oh. would have kept that one fairly natural because it wasn't a subjective moment. Right. I'm sure they... I'm sure Fo both Foley and Brennan put in a sound punching Stop, yeah. sound, but... It wouldn't have been uh, treated in a in such a subjective or stylistic way, just because of the nature of the drama at that moment is right. real. Whereas the the bone breaking is very heightened and uh, stylish. So was Lizzie entertained by the, yeah. the combination of vegetables? Yeah. Well, and this is you know as she's directing, sound is very new to her too. It's never been a sound effects in particular has never been a part of her life view. Right. Um, but now that she's directing, all aspects of what happens become something she's interested yeah. in. And she's mm -hmm. very, very smart and very observant. Mm. So she's taken in a lot of these new crafts, picture editing, sound editing, sound mixing, and started to figure out how to utilize them in her own storytelling. So a lot of the subjectivity of that episode 10, and in particular where sound is playing a role, was Lizzie shifting it and creating that as something she wanted. And so huh. like she wanted a very particular sound for the opening, the way that the delivery truck shows up. Yeah, that was really good. Yeah, like you know, so a lot of, you know, she's figured out that these are tools that she can use in storytelling. And so that and it's it's great fun for us, for sure, uh, to have her around and to be sharing that with her, sharing our craft. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's exciting. Totally. I wonder how many mm -hmm. episodes she'll do. Certainly three, I think. I think it's hard for her to do more than like three or four is right. the most that I think she can manage because the amount of prep and post work, right. it's a lot of work. Um, and everything else can't happen. Like we can't record with her in ADR while she's shooting. While she's directing. Yeah. While she's directing. She's, she just doesn't have time. So right. uh, everything, a lot of things stop when she's wearing those hats. So we have to, it has to be planned out. She can generally do the first, work on the first block because um, she can do nothing's her prep. Nothing's happening. Before, no, nothing's happening. So she can be, be in prep and then she can direct one or two like she did. She directed the first and second. And then I think she can direct maybe one or two more down the road. But it's hard, you know, it's yeah. very, very demanding on, on her time. And then that puts pressure on all the collaborators, all the departments, because yeah. everyone wants to picture it with her and sound edit yeah. with her. And, uh, and yet she still has to act. Although at this point, the acting is probably the easiest yeah. For yeah. job for her. Yeah. She's, it's, not, it's not hard for her to be great like she's just <laughs> great comes pretty yeah. naturally to be yeah. yeah excellent yeah she sounds like she never sleeps so. i know i literally worry about 
Uh, no, I, I actually think she sleeps. She doesn't do anything else very. Okay. Like, she just works and sleeps. Know, yeah. Like she, do, she's not somebody that goes out a lot or oh, yeah. like, she's just focused on what she's doing. I mean, I'm sure she gets by without much sleep because she does. I'm sure that she doesn't sleep a lot, but I also just think she's the, the sacrifice is life. Is her life. She doesn't go to the, gro mm -hmm. she doesn't go to the grocery store. Right. She doesn't go out for dinner very often, you know, or, um, just I can't energy. I can't imagine living a life where I missed the grocery store. So yeah. <laughs> Actually COVID helped me though too, because you can order your groceries and then go pick them up. Yes, you can. Yeah. Anyway, thank you so much. This is amazing. You're welcome. Thank you for talking to us so long. I really appreciate it. No problem. Yeah. It was fun. It really was nice to talk to it. fans of the show and people that are interested in it. Yeah. Well, you'll have to come back next year. If you wanted to do another sound uh, chat, I would recommend uh, connecting with Brendan Mercer that would be uh, awesome. because That'd be, it's yeah. a, a totally different worldview on right. on sound because he's on he's the sound designer and sound effects and everything is subjective for Brendan. He finds the way to bridge the transitions that occur in the show where we're going from natural to interior or subjective presentation yeah he's the one that kind of shifts the atmospheres you should ask him about the episode in season three i think when in the hospital i think it's episode 307 when june is in hospital oh my god that, yeah and she's going crazy listening yeah. to um oh god the uh, the what's machine. the yeah, mm -hmm. the Belinda Kyle. Kyle is oh, it that the, song. Oh, yeah. yeah. Ooh, baby. It, he, heaven on Earth. <laughs> and and Brandon's <laughs> basically made the hospital sounds. He built that all raw, and it basically tonally moves in and out of the song throughout oh, the, wow. the entire okay. episode. Wow. So there are, there are times when it's actually mimicking the rhythm and the Oh, and and wow. the song so she's she's hearing it and it's subliminal and then it becomes more and more pronounced and then she sings to it and the, the hospital beeps are so cool. <laughs> create, creating the song yeah it's a mesmerizing work um mm. that uh is even more in the weeds than what i do in the dialogue so <laughs> i'm sure i'm sure brennan yeah. oh we love that definitely yeah he's in mexico to. he lives in mexico oh, oh. nice well, and does he cool. always work does he come to toronto or he, he does he does he comes to toronto fairly frequently for mixes he's from toronto he uh -huh. moved to he went to mexico on a holiday met a woman Fell in love, got, got married and never came back. <laughs> and oh, that's a lovely story. I wish so, I was in Mexico uh, right now. He, uh, he comes, he comes to Toronto when he's needed for, you know, for a season of Handmaids, he might come two or three times, but he, he works there and yeah, he's a really fun, talented guy. Cool. Uh, there's a picture of your studio. It has like Handmaid's Tale on the wall. I don't know if that's always, I saw a picture of something some recording oh is you and lindsay maybe from this past season i think yeah anyway it looks like a very cool studio um, that studio's gone oh yeah, it closed the building was uh taken over it's being converted into condos so we've moved across the street uh. to an, an, another lovely studio but that one was home uh that was a studio i built with my partners or we built uh. Uh, and we were there for 15 it years sad. And, and oh. it, was so sad. it was a lovely lovely recording space too hey you asked a sad question no, that's a really that's okay. sad. but well no because it's linked because the very last recording we ever did in that studio was that recording where i took the photos with lizzie Oh my Aww, god, that's, that's yeah, amazing! Then, see, happy story. <laughs> I had asked her. I asked her in advance, like, I well, this is our last. Where this is the last recording we're doing in this studio. Could we take some pictures? And I, would, I wouldn't have just pulled out a camera on her. Um, yeah, <laughs> I wish she'd had still when she was bloody in her gown making the yeah. audiobook recording. <laughs> that would have been smart. That would have been good. I but, do get it otherwise. Yeah. But yeah, that the, so the la we closed that studio with uh, with Lizzie and the Handmaid's Tale. That's still. awesome. Way to Very go nice. out, right? Yeah. happy ending to a sad story all right we'll let you go thank okay. you thank Have you a great all. day you too thank you yes bye-bye i wish my video would stop thinking that i'm at a rave it is really like weird. i'm totally it's not <laughs> we'll, put like a, I'm... we'll put a beat to it or something like i know that. Yeah. Uh, yeah david can you put a beat to this uh <laughs> this video right now if I, if I had music skill i would try but uh... <laughs>